Hello everyone, so good to have you back at House of Refuge Church and Pastor James Jeffries. And we are going to look at what do you do when your best is not enough? You know, we hear people say, just try your best. All right, so say you put everything into it. You, you fast, you know, you're praying. You are, you're depriving yourself of the pleasures of this, of this world, watching TV and playing games and, and um, everything else that we do to fill up our time. And so you devote yourself to all of that and you're praying about something in particular. Maybe, maybe you're healing on, on a loved one <clears throat> or maybe you're healing in your own body. Uh, maybe some more discipline. Maybe you're trying to, to get a hold of the thoughts that come in your head. Maybe you're trying to overcome depression. And I can go on and on. It doesn't matter what it is. But you put forth your best. And then when, when you kind of like finish your fast or whatever, you find yourself not much better off, at least in this natural world. So what do you do then? Do you give up? You know, the disciples were faced with that dilemma in John chapter 6 when, when uh, Jesus said, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, and at the end everybody left, and the disciples were still there. He said, well, you leave too? And, and they said, where are we going to go? You have the words to eternal life. You know, but basically they were saying, we don't understand, you know, what's going on here. It's very confusing to us. And everything we try to do you always say, ye of little faith, or little, little to no faith. And why did you waver? And we always, you know, we think we're doing our best, and we follow in you, and yet our best isn't enough. And that's the thing, you know. Right off the bat, you know, you need to know that your best try is not enough. Okay, and then you can enter a dangerous zone that... You, you relying on something you've done. Oh, Lord, you have to heal me because I fasted. Oh, Lord, you have to do this in my life because I deprived myself of television for, for 30 days. And, uh, you know, on and on, we, we then began to put it into pride mode. So then even our best becomes prideful. So long as we're in this flesh, we're going to have to deal with it. Now, if you decide you don't want to deal with it, you say, man, I was trying to get my eating habits under control, say, and then you fail. Well, you know, you're going to have to deal with your life and your physical body and your mind and everything. If you don't deal with it anymore, then maybe you're going to die young. Or maybe you're going to, you're going to be, have a stroke or something and wind up in a, in a bed in a nursing home for the rest of your life. You know, we don't know what this, what's going to happen with this body. And so I'm going to talk to you about what would be the best and how your human best is not enough, okay? It's not going to be. I mean, I have been through many situations in my own life in, in 43 years of salvation, and um, you know, sometimes it didn't work out the way I wanted to. I remember going on a 21-day fast with only water, Man, I thought I was going to save the world after that. And after that, all that God dealt with me in that 21-day fast was me. He dealt with my heart. You see, I thought I was going to just go and raise the dead and do miracles and signs and wonders on top of each other and, and have the biggest church in the land type of thing. You know, I mean, that was my thinking, my carnal thinking. And at the end of all of that, the only thing I got out of it was something God did in my own heart. He began to lower my pride level down a bunch. That was it. 21 days of fasting. I did that three times, three years in a row. By the time I did it on the fourth time, he stopped me from doing it because Hurricane Katrina came and the church was gone and we had to rebuild and all. I didn't know that. But all three times when I finished up those fasts, he was dealing with something in my own heart, something down deep that he surfaced out of, out of me. And so, maybe I'm not the greatest minister. Maybe I'm not an elegant speaker. You know, maybe i am I'm got a lot of flaws in my flesh that people wouldn't be drawn to me. But all of that, I accomplished something down deep. And I'm going to talk about that this morning. I accomplished something down deep in my own soul that keeps me stable and keeps me in God's presence. Even when I fail, I've still got my flesh to deal with. Still deal with, with the skeletons in the closet, so to speak. 
But what do you do when your best is not enough? Okay. Proverbs 3 says this. My child, never forget the things I have taught you. Store my commands in your heart. If you do this, you will live many years and your life will be, now notice this word, satisfying. Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. I'm going to start expounding on, on these scriptures in just a few minutes as we go on. But I want to give you the whole, the whole gist of where we're going in these scriptures. Then you will find favor with both God and people. With both God and people. And you will earn a good reputation. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Okay? And there's a mouthful in all these scriptures. I hope I can get it done in a reasonable time. But whatever. I think we need this truth because I think every Christian that I know has been here. We've done the best we can do, and yet it's just not enough. So what do we do? Okay, number one. Never forget the things God has taught you. As I'm 43 years old in the Lord, the Lord has been teaching me things since day one. And great truth from the word of God and so forth. And sometimes the Lord has to bring me back around to a, to a place to resurface some of the things he's taught me because they get buried and it's, and it's not that, I mean, you can bury God's truth. He showed you with worldly things. But a lot of times it gets buried in, in some new things God's showing us. I get my focus on this new thing God's showing me, and I forget this, this old thing, but it's still there. It's part of my being. You know, if, if God would back up my physical life to when I was a baby, he could, he could show me everything I ate, that caused me to grow and become a man and to where I am today. And same thing with the Word of God. There, it's down inside of us. And God has put the Word in us. If you've been saved any length of time, God's been speaking to you. Every time you read the Bible, He's speaking to you. When you go to church, He's speaking to you. Some people listen to Christian videos like the one, this one's going to go on YouTube. And if you listen to it, it's going to speak to you. Okay? And some people turn it off because it's, sometimes it's speaking too loud and it's dealing with something we don't want no one to deal with, not even God. You know, so, but never forget the things God has taught you. Here in Hebrews 13, 5 in the Amplified, it says, let your character, that's what you are as a person, let your character, your moral essence, your inner nature, be free from the love of money. Now, I focused in on that. Not so much that I want to talk about money. I'm not even gone in that direction. But when I see this, I apply this in the way that he's saying, don't get, don't get caught up in what money can do for you. Because that, that could get you away from God. But I look at that as money can buy me anything. So it's, it's what money can buy me. It's what money can do for me to entertain me and so forth that can get me drifting away from God. So as I read this, I read instead of money, I read it as, um, you know, just anything that money can buy me, you see. So it says, be free from the love of money, shun greed, be financially ethical. You know, like it's, it would be better to not just spend it on yourself. But help missionaries and do things like that. Be ethical, okay? And it could mean save it and put it to where you can earn more interest or something. Maybe it could mean that. Being content with what you have. For he has said, I will never under any circumstance desert you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. Nor will I in any degree leave you helpless, nor will I forsake or let you down or relax my hold on you. So, in the Amplified, it's expounding on what the scripture's saying, okay? And what it's saying to us is that um, he will never leave you without support. So, he's talking about basically money, but he's talking about what money can buy. And so, money can buy me food, 
okay? Money can buy me a house so I won't have to sleep out in the gutter. It can buy me a car so I don't have to walk everywhere and get the place a lot quicker than walking, okay? So I don't have to hitchhike and, and rely on somebody else to take me somewhere. So he's saying, I will not leave you without support. And it's not that he's going to give a car to everybody. And it's not that he's going to give everybody the same amount of money. And it's not that he's going to give everybody a roof over their head. But what he is saying is that um, he's going to support you in wherever you are, okay? And whatever you, your call is in life. Just like the, there was a poor man named Lazarus in the Bible, and there was a rich man. Well, a poor man, Lazarus, he was by design, God had him to be there for that rich man. Had he reached out to Lazarus and blessed him with food and uh, kind of took him up under his wing, then maybe that rich man wouldn't have wound up in the torment of hell because that's where he wound up because he neglected him. So there are people around us and there are things around us that, you know, we, God might hold things back from us so we lack. But you might be lacking just so somebody with money will bless you. But don't be looking at those people as your source. God is your source. So there's a lot being spoken about when it comes to finance. You see, the people in this church who give, I, give, I thank God for them and I pray for them all the time. But they are not my financial source. God is using them to be a financial source. But it's God who is my real source who's motivating the people to give. Simple as that. I'm not motivating them to give, and I'm not manipulating them to give. I very seldom even preach on money, you, and the people at Tan Church here know that. But the idea is that instead of seeing money here, just like what it's saying, is to keep my love on God and not on the love on something that can, can provide something for me, you see. So, number two, speak the word of God, and you will be satisfied. Now, the satisfaction is to be filled with what you need. So if I back up to the first part <clears throat> and look at this one here, never forget the things God has taught you. So when you're not able to do your best, or your best is not enough, should I say, and in the title, well, maybe while you're doing the best you can do, maybe you're forgetting the things God has done, you see? So let's remember what he's done. Let's remember that he saved our soul. Let's remember that, you know, it was, it was our pride and sin that kept us from being able to do our best to begin with. So we need to remember all that truth. So as we move on to number two, we see it saying, speak the word of God and you will be satisfied. Now, the satisfaction is to be filled with what you need. All right. The word satisfied in a dictionary basically means to be filled up, to be content. All right? I sit down to eat because I'm hungry. Then I reach a place where I'm not hungry anymore. If I continue to eat, I might get sick. So I'm filled up, I'm satisfied, and I stop eating. Okay? Comes a time when, when things that we, we might need a vacation, we might need to stop and play a game or something, uh, you know, watch some TV just to, to relax, all right? But after a while, you're going to get filled on that, okay? It's just going to fill you up. But like everybody who overeats, we're just going to keep on overeating the entertainment, overeating the things that, that in this life, you know, brings us some type of pleasure because our flesh likes that. Our flesh doesn't want to be satisfied in reading the Bible, you know, so many Christians read this a little bit, and then they off giving pleasure to their flesh again. You know, and um, so number two here, if you want the best, if you want your best to be more productive, you know, because you reached a place where your best wasn't working, well, the words of your mouth will bring satisfaction. Let me show you that. Now here in Proverbs 12, 14, in the Amplified Bible, it says, A man will be satisfied with the good from the fruit of his words. And the deeds of a man's hands will return to him as a harvest. Now, 
He's putting the two together. And basically what you're seeing here is faith without works is dead being alone. The book of James, chapter 2. So the words of your mouth in James, the book of James, chapter 3, talks about the tongue. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. No man can tame it. Well, you tame your heart because the Bible says out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. So your heart is where you believe. And it's in our heart we believe. And then we make confession to salvation. We open our mouth. And, we, and salvation came into, into our being and our life. And now we're saved, okay? Because we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and we confessed him with our mouth. Romans 10.10. 10. So, right here he's saying, a man will be satisfied with the good from the fruit of his word. So, I speak, I believe, I speak, and then I get up and go do something, Okay? Because, just like the scripture I read at the beginning, we're going to talk about that in a minute, but trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. He will show you which way to go. So right here, the deeds of a man's hands, now that doesn't mean necessarily only doing things with our hands, okay? We've got to get our mind more broad on what the scriptures are truly saying, and it's just saying the work of our hands, <clears throat> going to work on the job and getting a raise because you're not sleeping on the job, you're doing the job you, you um, were hired to do, and because you do a good job, you'll get a raise, I mean possibly, or just you're reaching out to people, you can, you're helping them, that's using your hands, not necessarily touching them at all, but you're, you're, you're praying, say you're using the spiritual hands, you're going to the grocery and getting some food for some hungry person. Um, you know, you're, you're at church and you're showing up for the prayer time. And, uh, you know, just this is the work of your hands, okay? It just means to be busy. That's all. It doesn't, it's not zeroing in. That's why people have a lot of misunderstanding about scriptures when they're not able to broaden what is being said. And when it's saying the deeds of a man's hands will return to him as a harvest. So what the Lord is saying is that from the words of our mouth, we have to have our heart, you know, trained on the Lord and our confession of the word of God, making a stand on the word of God, confessing that scripture, the promises of God are yes and amen. So the best you can do is going to involve disciplining your life. So what you think is the best you know, what do you do when your best just isn't enough? Well, the best thing that you can do to have the best shot at life is to zero in on God, okay? Speak the truth of God's words. Quit speaking the negative stuff. Oh, I can't do this. I just, I can't fast that long and stuff like that. It's not necessary. What is necessary is that your heart changes, okay? We're going to talk about the heart in just a minute, but I have to include it in this part because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. And out of the, the, when we start to speak, if we put the word, the true word inside of us, that word will come out, okay? So if I was believing in my heart and then I confess my mouth and it brought salvation, and that is what we need to get to heaven, just think how powerful it is to do anything else, to put the truth of God's word. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. And then by speaking, what I, if I believe that scripture, and I speak it, and then I find myself um, you know, strengthened to go even more, go, to go further than I thought I could go in ministering to people, in touching lives, you know, being able to, to um, be there when I'm needed, okay, type of thing. And then there's a blessing, you see, there's a blessing. That's the work of my hands. If I, somebody's in the hospital and they call me and I get out of bed and get dressed and get over to the hospital and pray. That's the work of my hands. You see, I'm going to have a harvest. I'm not doing it to receive a harvest. Even though the scriptures does, it does teach me to deliberately do things for a harvest. But I know, you see, I know that the harvest is going to come. So I don't focus on that harvest You'll never get a harvest if you're not focused on the ground, watering it, fertilizing it, protecting it from the animals or the evil things of life. 
you know? And uh, so if I don't do all these things, if I'm just focused on down the road harvest, and I don't do these things, the harvest will never be there, okay? It'll dry, the sun will dry it out, the animals will eat it, it'll get trampled under people's feet. You're not there nurturing it, you see? So that nurturing process, the first work of your hands, is to train your heart with the Word of God, okay? You see, that is the best you can do. All the other stuff will come about in its own time, fasting, praying, all of that. But getting that truth inside of you is the work of your hands. I know you're not maybe using your hands to hold your Bible and flip the pages or your phone to, to read the scriptures. That might be the work of your hands, but it's still a work of your hands. It's still, you're physically doing something, okay? You need to strengthen yourself. You look at yourself in the mirror and you're overweight and you're unhealthy and you go to the doctor and your blood work's terrible and you know, they want to put you on pills and everything. Let me tell you something. Good, healthy diet and exercise. I'm guilty of not doing both of them, okay? I'm trying to do my best now. My best isn't enough. So I need God's help to help me to eat right, to exercise more often. Try to do exercise every day, a little bit each day. And then you go get some blood work and you see everything starting to get better, okay? So spiritually, it's the same way. Sp uh, bodily exercise, it'll profit a little bit, keep you maybe a little more healthy, okay, on this earth. But spiritual exercise, exercising your faith, man, that's, that's above all things. You need to exercise your faith. So when you read your word and read it diligent, then you start developing that faith to believe that word, and then you get that in your heart, and then that will be the best you can do. You see, the best I can do is speak the truth that I believe in, okay? I believe that God is for me, so I speak that. I tell the devil, God is for me, get out of my life in Jesus' name, okay? So we need to get the truth in it. That's what we need to speak. You know, get your good promise book on the promises of God and, and find the promises for whatever your problem is. And get that in your heart, meditate on it, you know, uh, memorize it. And, uh, you know, we can always say, all right, this is not a good, I can't memorize everything. Uh, so what? Memorize the, the truth in it, okay? You know, we got to quit with the excuses. The excuses have gotten us all the way to wherever we are in life, which is usually not good. Quit the excuses. Lock in on the truth of God's word and know that God is for you. He's not against you. He wants you to get healthy. He wants you to succeed. He wants you to have a sound mind. He wants you to be the best witness on this earth you can be. So the best thing that isn't enough, you see, you found out that the best you can do isn't enough. Well, what do you do? Well, the best thing you really should be doing is getting that truth into you. That is the best thing you can do. And as you begin to believe it, your mouth will speak it. And then you will get busy because you believe it. You'll start helping people and touching lives and all that kind of stuff. And a harvest will come in. And then when you're in need, your need will be met because you're meeting the needs of others. Amen? Number three, be loyal to the Lord and he will be loyal to you. You know, in the book of James, once again, chapter four, it says, draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. Okay? We know that. So be loyal to God and he will be loyal to you. In the scripture it says to be loyal. And, and, you know, remember to be loyal to God. Okay, the church in Pergamum, okay? This is a church in Revelation chapter two, there's seven churches. And in this one in particular, I'm gonna zero in on their loyalty to God and watch what Jesus said about it. He said, I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne. Let me tell you people, it's not just the city, it's the whole world. Wickedness is abounding and the church is in the midst of it, okay? So you're in the midst, whatever the area is that you're weak in, well, it's not saying Satan has possessed you, so man, don't even take this wrong. But there's something in there that's not godly, let's put it that way. And it's running your life and it wants to kill you 
You overeating, into sexual things, you smoking, doing some drugs, drinking, and I can go on and on and then start getting into just television watching and lustful movies and all that kind of stuff, you know, and whatever your weakness is, that's where Satan's throne is. That's the stronghold. You're not possessed, okay? If you're saved, have the Holy Spirit, you're not possessed. But he can interject thoughts into you, and he knows what your weakness is. Jesus said, and Paul said it in 2 Corinthians 12, that the Lord told him, in your weakness I'll be strong. So in your weakness where the enemy zeroed in on, God is zeroed in on that weakness also, okay? And you say, well, if he is, how come I fail all the time? Well, he wants to make you strong. You're doing your best to not, and you keep failing. It's not enough. But there are some things that you can put into place, all right? So he told, us, he told the church, I know that you live in the city where Satan has a throne, yet you have remained loyal to me. You know, we all have weaknesses, and we all at times are going to stumble over those weaknesses, okay? And until you get strong, you're probably going to stumble a lot over the same thing. The stronger you get, there will be more space between it. But that's a weakness. That's part of who you are as a person. And you need to control it. You need to bring it into submission to you, okay? So, now what the church in Pergamum did was that in the midst of all the temptations the devil was throwing at them and attacking them and beating them and so many things they were going through, they still remain loyal. So the best you can do is remain loyal to God. Don't give up going to church. Don't give up, you know, reading your Bible. Don't, just, don't give up. I mean, people give up on those diets. Sometimes they see it working, but they don't want to, they don't want to stay committed. They're too weak. They want to go back to the trash eating. And so they make excuses, you know. So quit making excuses and stay on it. And think about the goal that you set of being healthy, losing weight. Spiritually, stay on top of that sin nature, that, that weakness of that sin you keep, that keeps, you keep stumbling over. You know, stay on it and continue. In Hebrews 12, it says, you know, that, that, that he told the Hebrew church that the weights of sin that so easily beset them. And he said, here's your problem. You have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. So the idea is that, you know, don't quit. Continue striving against sin. And it means resisting unto blood. That means you say, I'm going to get through this thing or I'm going to die trying. And it might take your whole life and then die, okay? I don't know how long it will take you. All I know is that <clears throat> your flesh is a worthy opponent. He's, your flesh is tough. And it's going to take some real discipline to overcome it. And you will need the Holy Spirit's help. Period. You're not going to do this on your own. So the best you can do is lean on God. And that will get you through. So remain loyal to the Lord. Uh, he, said, you he said, you refuse to deny me even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred and among you there and among you there in Satan's city. Now, just, just to tell you, okay, why did I put that and leave that in there? Who is this guy, Antipas? I don't know. It doesn't really matter. But what matters is, is that you get this thought in your head. You're saying, okay, some of the great ministers of God have failed him. Going off into pornography, committed adultery, quit the ministry. Some have become homosexual. On and on. And people put their faith in these ministers. They look up to these ministers and they still failed. You know, the idea is that Antipas was a faithful witness. He didn't fail. He was put to death. Okay, God let him die. And I believe God let him die just so he could see what reaction Pergamum, the rest of the church, would do. Oh, if he couldn't stand, he was a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. If he couldn't stand, how am I going to do it? You see, so if some big minister, big name minister, he fell, and you say, if, man, that minister, look, he had a big church and thousands of followers and a TV ministry, and he failed. What kind of shot I got? You got the same shot he's got, and that person could have succeeded had they 
and had they gotten their spirit man under control and so forth. Everybody has the same chance, all right? So the people in Pergamum did not quit when this guy, Antipas, who evidently was a very faithful man, okay? And when they saw that, they continued to stay in there and be loyal to God. So some people went through some things and, you know, they didn't do anything evil to go through them. Some did. Doesn't matter whether they were righteous and they still went through something or unrighteous and they deserved to get what they got. Either way, you need to get your focus correct when it comes to following somebody. It's okay to follow somebody, but don't let that somebody replace Christ, all right? So keep your focus on Jesus. Jesus did not fail us. He was put to death for our sins, not his own, okay? And then he triumphantly rose from the dead. So keep your focus on him. Stay loyal to Jesus. So if you, if you tried a hundred times to, to defeat this problem in your life and you fail, go for 101, 102 if it takes. Just keep going. Don't stop, okay? Don't quit. If you've been on a hundred diets and every one of them you quit or failed and it didn't work in your own mind, then start a new one. Try again. Think about what's at stake. In the spirit, eternal life is at stake. In the physical body, a healthy body. If I'm going to live to be 90, I want to live healthy. I don't want to wind up in a nursing home for, you know, the rest of my days. Dying, I mean, just waiting to die and begging God to take me. You know, I want to, I want to be active. I want to be busy serving the Lord. And when I die, I want to just get out of here, maybe in my sleep. Or I don't want to drop, drop dead in the pulpit while I'm preaching. I'd freak everybody out. But I just want to go to bed at night and, and go or whatever it takes, just go quickly. I don't want to linger on. I mean, if I do, I do, okay? Some things you're just out of control. But if I can try to be loyal to God and be loyal to my eating habits, then I'll have loyalty in the spirit and loyalty in the flesh. Amen? Number four, trust the Lord with all of your heart. <clears throat> Not some of your heart, okay? We got things that are taking up sections of our heart. And, um, and so we need to get to a place where we, we devote all to the Lord in priority and first place. I mean, we're not going to be able to separate my, my love for my wife, my love for my children, my love for my grandchildren, the love for my church people. I'm not going to be able to separate my love for Christ and from them. But I can keep him as the priority love by staying close, by worshiping, by praising, you see, putting all my, my faith in him. I trust in my family, but I put all my faith in the Lord. Okay, my family might fail me because they're human. My, my friends might fail me. They're just human. I might fail them because I'm just human. You know, I want them to follow me as I follow Christ. But I don't want them to put me as Christ. I would, make a, I would stop that in a heartbeat if I knew somebody put that kind of faith in me. You know, just like Jesus when they came, they said, good master. And he immediately said, there's no one good except God. You know, he put him in his right place. Don't you call me good. Even though, my goodness, he was good, right? But he put him in his place. Only God the Father is good. And so that's how we have to stay. Here in Jeremiah 29, it says, now let's, let's look at who he's talking to and what he's saying, and then apply it to our lives. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Now he's telling Israel they were, they were sent off to Babylon and because they were in rebellion and they, they failed you know, to serve God, and the end result was they got drug off to Babylon. So, Jeremiah writes and he says, when you're in Babylon, and you come to your senses, and you realize that you need God, and then when you seek him with your whole heart, you're going to find him, okay? You will find me when you seek me with your whole heart. So, what am I saying here? I'm saying when you're at your wits end on what to do about your problem, Okay, look at your problem as being like Babylon. It has drug you away from God. 
and has drug you to the place of sin repeatedly. It's brought you to the place of a sick body. It's brought you to the place of, of bad relationships with friends and family and so forth. When you finally, and let's look at Babylon, which means confusion. You're in the middle of confusion. You're in the middle of this thing, and you just cannot figure out how to stop it from, from going on. When you finally hit the bottom like the prodigal son did in the pig's pen, and you say, Lord, I need you. Then it says, I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. Okay, so God has allowed your situation. He allowed Israel to go off into Babylon. And, um, and Assyria was the first tribes that went off. So right here, you can get drug off on your problems. You know, you're eating wrong. And, you know, you're doing okay. All of a sudden, boom, something physical hits you. And you find out later it was because of the food you were eating. All right? Sugars and all that stuff. You are getting into pornography, and, and you pretty much was keeping it under control. But then more and more happened, and something bad could take place with that. And on and on it goes. When you don't have those lusts under control, you think you can handle it. Well, you handle it for a little while, but then you reach a place, and something starts to happen that is way out of your control. When you get to that place... That's, black. That's Babylon, okay? That's the place of confusion. How did I get here? How did I let this happen? And you get down on your face and on your knees and you just say, oh my God, help me. And you cry and then you just shook to the core. That's with your whole heart. When you're finally admitting that you need God and you messed up your life and then you begin to cry out. He said, I will bring you back from where I have sent you cap to be captive. I allowed it to happen. Okay? I couldn't break your free will, he says, and I had to let it happen. But I was right there so that when you finally hit the bottom, here I am. I promised I would never leave you. I would never forsake you. I'm right here with you. Seek his will. Okay? Seek his will. Not my will, Lord, but your will be done. Proverbs 3, 6. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. All right? So in, in some translations, it says to acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. So if you would seek his will, Lord, which path to take? What is your will for my life? Sometimes he might not say anything, and because you've sought the Lord... Now you can make your own choice. You know, you, you might fast, pray, give it some time. Don't jump into the situation. And, and if you don't hear the Lord, maybe, you're not, maybe you need to do some fasting. And turn off the TV. Stop everything because you, you really need God's will on this situation. And so, but you still don't hear the Lord. Well, after you've done all you know to do, then you can make your own choice. And no matter where you find yourself, even if it turns out to be the wrong choice, because you have sought the Lord, he now will, will enter that place and begin to show you what to do. All right? Now, and, and in many cases, when you seek him, he'll tell you, take the right road or take the left way or, you know, uh, go work here, don't work there. He might, he might do that. And then he might just simply let you make the choice, and if it's the wrong choice, he might stop it right in its tracks. You know, and, um, you know, it never, never used to fail in my life that whenever I was trying to make a decision on doing something, I only basically, either I do it or don't do it, it was one thing. But the moment I started seeking God, I would get another offer. Lord, now I have two things. Which one is you? And I would have to really seek God to see which way to go with that. Okay? In one case, he just said, doesn't matter. Make your choice. I'm going to be with you wherever you go because I'm actually bringing you to become a pastor. And I didn't know that at the time. So, you never know what God has planned for you up here. 
And so if he's not answering, pretty much he's saying, you, you know, you sought me with all that's in you. I didn't answer. Now make your choice. Because no matter which choice you make, I'm, I'm going to prepare you for this place right here when you get there. Okay? So seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. So, in finishing up this morning <clears throat> with these five, five points, and I'm, and I'm sure there's more stuff, but I was just using those scriptures at the beginning, okay, in, in the beginning there, and I like, I like how it began. Let me back up. I want to go all the way back to the very beginning, not that one, or that one, right here. My child, never forget the things I have taught you. I want to back up and end with that <clears throat> this morning. Okay? You see, the scriptures tell us, but it's in the Old Testament, it just says, line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. He's building your life, okay, to bring you to a final place of witness. I don't, you know, that might be the way you die. You die with glorifying God and giving him all the glory and praise. And that might be the greatest witness. Like Samson. You know, Samson's last victory killed more Philistines at his death than he did in his whole life put together. You see? And uh, so he died doing that. So maybe it's going to be on the deathbed. Maybe it's going to be at the end of your days. But God is building for that. All right? And so we've got to be sure that we are remembering, you know, and, and what you need to do is just simply say, Holy Spirit, remind me. Remind me of what God has taught me. And show me how God has been building on each scripture. And he has been expanding the scriptures more and more to teach me. And, and help me to remember how much I need the Lord every day. Help me to not be comfortable in anything I do, but everything I do, let me lean on the Holy Spirit. And so we, we, need to, we need to learn these things. So what do you do, okay, when your best is not enough? Now I'm talking about your human best, and all of this will perfect your spiritual best. The things God is adding to your life, that is the best. The best thing you can do is seek him with your whole heart. Amen? All right, let me pray for you. Father, I pray for everyone that's listening to me. And I pray that they will set a goal in their life to make it to heaven. And set a physical goal in life to be healthy and be of sound mind. And so we're just on a journey right now to learn the physical things and the spiritual things that will get us to our final destination. Help us, Lord, in our decision makers. Help us, O oh Lord, to, to know what the scriptures are saying. That we eat the scriptures that we need in our life. And all scriptures are good. But sometimes we need certain ones for what's going on in our life. So I pray for every one of them in Jesus' name. Amen.